Thomas White when I got out uh, as an E5. I was a sergeant, a military police platoon, so I was a team leader. And I was in from January of 2001 to January of 2009. I love the military. I, I'm a history buff. So it was it was part of who I was, um, you know, mentally. Um, but in all honesty, the driver was 100% college tuition. So I, I thought this was going to be one week in a month, two weeks a year. Maybe there'd be a natural disaster that we would help out on. Of course, then I, I leave for basic training in, in August of 2001. So I'm on my way to advanced first aid when things start changing a little bit one day. And then we receive very little information then that um, the, the Pentagon and the, the World Trade Center had been attacked. So this was a real world situation now. And when you leave here, you're not going to a, a peacetime, uh, peacetime status. You're going to, to a unit that's going to be preparing for war. I'm not gonna say that I was some, you know, hardcore brainwashed, you know, soldier. I, I, was, I was terrified and I was very fortunate at that time to make a good connection with the recruiting sergeant in our area. And the conversation that we had oddly enough, but I guess it, it makes sense, is you look really good in a uniform. Would you like to be a recruiting assistant? And I'm like, if that's the qualification, yeah. Um, if, if you don't need any other qualifications to do that. So I said, sure, I'll help you out with that. I started going to high schools and, and trying to recruit soldiers. So eventually the orders did come down uh, for us to, to accept a different mission. Um, and I was faced with that question of recruiting is an essential duty at this point because again, we're trying to fill these positions. If you want to stay here and stay in this recruiting capacity, you can. Well, that's a no brainer. Absolutely, I do want to stay here and in that capacity. So so that's, I, I, I was very fortunate to have done the rest of my time in that recruiting capacity. Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I believe was you know, it was obviously during the Clinton administration, so sometime in the 90s. Was it a good solution to, you know, a, a very bad problem? No, it was not a good solution by any means. Was it good for, you know, the contemporary, you know, world at that time? I, I don't know, maybe. For me personally, it was like the 300 pound gorilla, I think, in the room all the time. It was always that, that piece of you that you knew you could never talk about, tell, or act on because there was going to be some kind of serious ramification, you know, whether that was simply disciplinary and, you know, and, and forcing you out of, out of the military, or was it going to be something worse that was going to put you in physical danger, um, which certainly many LGBT soldiers went through as somebody in the military, as a soldier, as somebody that's indoctrinated into that thinking, it was just an, an order that you just processed and that's the way you lived with it. And we lived with a lot of things that we didn't like to do, or, you know, I didn't like getting up in the morning and running for five miles, um, but that's my orders and that's what I did because I was a soldier and that's what I did. Um, so it, you almost get in that kind of mindset. And how horrible is that? Um, how horrible is that, that, that that's what that becomes? I don't think you realize it at the time, but all those experiences and those things that happen, I think, you know, that leaves a scar on your psyche. You know, the military is all about assimilating and being one and we're all the same. And I think we now know we need to be able to operate the same and as one, but we know that every organization is stronger when we're diverse. So I, I hope the military has now embraced that. Everything you learn in the military, uh, hopefully you carry with it. And to me, as, as cheesy as it might sound, those army values are still important to me. It's you know, loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, integrity, and personal courage. Uh, those are all values that can see you through every part of your life, no matter what that is. The other part of what the military tr teaches you that is so valuable for anybody is no matter what the adversity is, you can get through it and you can persevere and you can get to the other side and keep on going. My name is Angela Swain. 
specialist Angelus Wayne, and I was a medic in the 557th Medical Company in Wiesbaden, Germany. I served there for two years and I was in the reserves here in Columbus at the 914th Cash Unit for four more years. When I graduated from high school, I worked at warehouse jobs and, and uh, tried to pay to go to, actually to go to Columbus State just paid my, for myself. And then I heard that I can get the Army College Fund, you know, but it was like probably two years after I graduated from high school was when I started thinking about it. But also that's when the Gulf War was going on and my uh, brother joined the Army and he was actually in the Gulf War. And that started really motivating me because I was thinking if he could do it, then I've got to do it too, because I always want to be just like my big brother. When I first joined, I just remembered that I was really nervous when I was talking to the recruiter, because I was thinking, I can't tell him that I'm attracted to women and that I've been with a woman. Like, I can't tell him that. I had a lot of cognitive dissonance because I'm a very honest, truthful person. And that was probably one of the hardest things, like just not being able to just say yes. But I knew that I couldn't. Like I knew that I would not be able to join the army if I said yes. It was kind of weird to lie about who I was. By the time I was leaving Germany, that's when the don't ask, don't tell became enacted into a law was like 1993, that's when I left Germany. Cause I just remember thinking in my head like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. But then like, it was kind of weird because the more I thought about it, I was like, no, actually that's not kind of cool because I still can't be who I am. Like I'm still not allowed to say that I'm attracted to women too. Like I'm attracted to guys too, but I'm also attracted to girls, you know? And I wasn't allowed to say that. So it was, really kind of weird to me to, you know, like I felt good about it, but then I started not feeling very good about it, you know, because it was still hiding myself, you know. When I was in basic training, the Gulf War was like, you know, coming to an end. The, the first, that was Desert Storm. And, you know, my, my brother was in, uh, in right in the middle of all that. So he had a different experience than me. He's not here now. He was in the war and he came back home and had PTSD and he actually took his life. My life took a total turn when my brother committed suicide. And um, that took a lot for me. I was just in a really bad place. And I remembering about being gay, you know, being bisexual, thinking I'm attracted to guys, I'm attracted to girls. In retrospect, I almost feel like had that not have happened, I don't know if I would have came out like then, but when that happened, the man that I was with, his name is Jim, the man that I was with, and he's the father of my two daughters, which I have no regrets about that whatsoever. I was totally in love with him when we got married and I have no regrets that way either, but I just wonder had that not happened, if something would have changed, you know? And I was in this weird place, and I know that I had wanted to come out to everyone, but then I just kind of went within myself for like two years. I finally started hinting on who I was when I started seeing that maybe my children were gay too. And I wanted to tell them and have that experience with them, but then I also wanted to be true. Like I had had a relationship before and we ended up being really good friends, you know, and I didn't want to out the person that I had had a relationship with before. So I struggled with that for a long time and I had even actually talked to her about it and she didn't want anybody to know still. Like, so it is what it is and I have integrity. So here I am, but I also wanted to talk to my kids. So I was like in another spot once again. So now I have no regrets that I said anything because now I can like 
talk to them about whatever I need want to talk to them about and I I am 1000% me now you know like and that was the only thing that was holding me back now when I look at like my kids and I look and see that there are like people in the service and they're just like who they are and you, you know they there can be two men married to each other with kids and two women with kids and they're in the service and I just think that's awesome like I don't even know if I have words of wisdom to share with anybody because I'm just like, I feel like everybody has their own experience and I just feel like just be always be true to yourself, you know, just like always be you. And I'm very happy for anybody who's gay that's in the service that they can just not have to hide anything, you know, that they can just be who they are. As the army would say, be all you can be. <laughs> Brian Goodson, United States Air Force, Staff Sergeant. Five years active, five years reserves. My dad was a, a Korean War veteran, I had an uncle who also served in the Navy. I grew up around uh, a lot of veterans, and I very, grew up in a very patriotic setting, so it just seemed to be the natural course of my life was to join the military. It just depended on which branch I wanted. Obviously, dad wanted Navy. Air Force is where I want to be. Well, anyone who served in the Air Force knows you always start out at Lackland Air Force Base for basic training. I did my first year and a half at Omaha, Nebraska. And after that, I uh, applied for transfer and did the bulk of my active duty actually at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, which was a phenomenal tour. I loved, loved every aspect of that one. After that, I separated from active duty, came to reserves. I was stationed here at Rickenbacker for about a year before they moved my assignment down to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Your team becomes your family. I mean, even though, just like, you know, at home, I couldn't tell them at home, I couldn't tell these guys, you know, who I really was. There was still this aspect of camaraderie, this, this team building aspect, this, this sense of pride that we have each other's back. I actually served before the don't ask, don't tell. We used a different term that's not civil for work. Don't get me wrong, I loved my time in the service, but the fear of being found out. I mean, if you found out then, it was automatic dishonorable discharge, no questions asked, you know, and, you know your life ended. And then you come back to a civilian life, your parents now know, your friends now know. So there was always that aspect of terror. So even though I, I enjoyed my time, it created a lot of resentment in my life, um, a lot of anger, a lot of depression, um, and, and a very diminished self-worth on who I was because I couldn't be who I thought I needed to be. And even then, I would, really didn't even come out to myself. So it was a struggle for a long period of time. I struggle with depression because of it to this day, actually. So. And this is where I think what, where uh, Team Red, White, and Blue comes in for me. I got involved in this organization in 2014, and I found that the exercise, the aspects of you know being able, being a runner and being now the athletic director for Team Red, White, and Blue, has allowed me to open up to new people, meet new people, and express who I am. And then I have found this running aspect, this this physical aspect of running for me, which is the, the bigger aspect. It really helps me deal with the, the PTSD, the anger, uh, the resentment, and and uh, the self worth. If I was the same young man in today's military, I think I would be looking to be you know, a career officer. Um, even though I was enlisted at the time, I thought about becoming an officer. It was just a different time frame for me. Um, the depression, you know, the self-worth issues that I struggled with because I couldn't come out, I think stunted that aspect a lot. Go out there and be the best you. That's all you have to be. Every day, make sure you're, you're a better you than you were yesterday, but always be your best you. And don't let anything stand your way. You know, don't let any barriers get in your way. Doesn't matter what your orientation is, step forward, be the person you need to be, be that better you.